you know, it can build up fast in different ways. If the property is 100K and you only have to put down 20 to 25K, but then that property, due to all these inflationary effects that we're talking about, goes to 130K. Well, that Mm -hmm. 30K, that's yours. Right. Not the banks, the bank that was on the hook for the other 80 to 75 to 80 K of that mortgage. So you pick up those. I know that's not how you, you preach things, but in this, in, in a situation where the money printing is what it is, it's going to play more of a role. It is my pleasure to welcome a guest that I've been bugging to be on the show for quite a while, and he finally gave in. And that is our uh, client and my friend, Keith Gibson. He is a professional poker player. He's been in the World Series of Poker 10 times, and he's a super modest guy, but really has some very interesting insights on the economy, inflation, cryptocurrency, namely Bitcoin, and we'll talk about all that. So Keith, welcome. How are you? I'm doing good, buddy. How you doing? Yeah, good. It's good to have you. So thanks for finally coming on the show. <laughs> you're you're very persistent, you know. You, you yes. Uh, you know, they say if you ask uh, what's 300th times a charm, is that what's happened yeah. here? That's what I try to tell, you know, when I'm training salespeople, I try to tell them that you got to ask and then ask again. <laughs> you know, it finally will work. The other thing I didn't down. mention about you that's that's really interesting is that you are quite the biohacker and you have a lot of knowledge on, you know, biohacking and health. And right now you have, I believe your infrared lights on, right? It's early morning in Las Vegas. So uh, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So I turned the infrareds off, but right now there's still some red hue coming off my computer screens and off a, a red uh, LED in the background. We don't turn our lights on until uh, until the sun's up because uh, right. I think people at this point pretty much understand that, you know, bright blue lights affect circadian rhythm. I mean, it's already like, no question. It's, it's part of the part of the you know software of your phone at this point so and now uh, finally it is it's wet long overdue and you know I'll, I'll just say um you know try in general to plan your life around the rhythm of nature you know you should become sleepy when it's dark and turn down the lights in your house i do that every night and you know when it's light out you should expose yourself to the sun so you know that's how we were meant to live in harmony with nature. So, you know, people can call me an old man, but that's why I go to bed at about 930. So <laughs> I got you, know. you buddy. I'm, I'm, a, yeah. I'm I sleep from about 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. Every, every wow. Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Well, hey, first off, tell us about your background, if you would. Uh, you know, you're a professional poker player. I remember, I mean, you've been on several of our trips with Adventure Alliance. You went to the Ice Hotel in Sweden with our group yeah. and to Hawaii and, and other trips. It's just always great to have you and Lacey join us for those things. I remember when I lived in Las Vegas for a short time, I, I came down and saw you in the World Series of Poker. And and the thing that struck me about that, Keith, which I got to say, I was there with a, a buddy of mine and you were sitting down at the poker table. You know, there's like TV cameras around and everything. And you just got up to talk to us. And I'm like, isn't there a bunch of money you need to be sitting at that table worrying about? I thought we were just going to wave at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there's different stages. I, I think you mentioned to me, I don't actually remember exactly where we were in, at that point in the main event for sure. If it were the final table and there were literally millions of dollars on the line, you would have ignored us. Moment, I would have okay. ignored you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm good, good, good. But you probably came when it was, you know, uh, midway through where the, everything's not worth much. And in those events, um, without being too, too critical, like the play player pool is very, what we call soft, you know, there, there's a lot of amateur players in there. And so the fact of the matter is uh, I'm, I already have a great feel for how, how everybody plays. Whereas if I were playing with only experts, like which would happen in a tougher tournament, then mm-hmm. I would uh, I would have stayed focused and been like, okay, this is what's happening now. Wave to Jason. Sure. Okay, let's. Yeah. Be, be I, I was just so amazed at how nonchalant you were about the whole thing. But <laughs> that was funny. Well, well you um, gotta also keep in mind it's I played, you know, 
thousands and thousands of hours. It's right. not, it's not as though this was, it, it wasn't, if it had been my first event, again, you would have gotten a different, different reaction, I'm sure. Understood. No, you're, you're, you're a professional. So, you know, it's like, uh, it's the 10,000 hour rule, right? You know, you yeah. know, you've got, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, for sure. And I've, you know, I moved out to, to Vegas as soon as I turned 21. I, uh, I, I had been playing, I started out, so I actually started out playing uh, basically blackjack. And even before that, I started winning at online casinos when I was about 17 years old. So I was there back in the day, and I'm sure this is still true to some degree, but you could beat online casinos fairly easily because they would offer in order to differentiate themselves, they would offer like marketing deals. And these marketing deals made all of their games a positive advantage for the knowledgeable like player. And so it wasn't difficult at all to beat these online casinos. And in doing, in doing that, I started learning more about how to beat actual casinos and from the ages of 18 to 21, I went from casinos where you could play. So there's a lot of like Native American casinos, for example, in the U.S. that you can play at at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So I had done pretty well just going to those. But as soon as I turned 21, right. I mean, I think I had I bought a house in Las Vegas within like a couple months of turning 21. I just right. came out here and was doing really well because there's so many casinos in like one, one concentrated place. You can just find opportunities mm -hmm. and, you know, people have seen movies like 21, uh, uh based on the, uh, Ben Mesrick book, bringing down the house about mm -hmm. these teams, uh, that, w that could beat up on casinos. And that's a, exactly what I did with that within being here I, I was on a team almost right away you just run into them if uh -huh. you know what you're looking for interesting it's kind, yeah. of, it's kind of funny yeah and you had a second home in Macau you and Lacey did and yeah. you know you were really into this I mean you you make real money uh, playing poker so that's uh, that's amazing you know congratulations but you're also really a student of economics and we've had you know countless conversations on the topic and I just thought I'd ask you know, what attracted you to income property investing? And then what is your view of the future? And I have a feeling this is going to roll into a Bitcoin discussion too, because I think that's a proxy like as is gold for a future that is probably inflationary, but I, I don't know your view on it exactly. So uh, tell us what got you interested in, in real estate in the first place. It kind of ties into that gambling background because that's extremely individualistic and also libertarian. You come across um, as a gambler carrying cash, for example, you come across situations where the government might just take your money. Mm -hmm. and, and that's such a such a epiphany for somebody to be like, wait, the government could just do that. Well, what they, do you they, what do you mean they could just do that? I mean, I know you're you're a deep libertarian thinker too. And do you mean through taxation or or what are you talking about? While I definitely think that's true, no, I meant more through civil forfeiture, civil asset forfeiture. You can be traveling, so like notoriously. Right. Oh, yes. We've done shows on civil asset for forfeiture. And by the way, listeners and viewers, this is an incredibly scary issue. So, Keith, I'll just tee it up for you and then sure. you can say the rest. The government, and you know, we've got past episodes on this with attorneys and so forth, the government can literally seize your property take your property without even convicting you of a crime and in some cases without even formally accusing you of a crime just the suspicion of a crime you could lose your house your car your savings accounts other properties it is incredibly scary how the rights of government have expanded so dramatically over the years. If you don't know what we're talking about, go to jasonhartman.com, type in on the search bar civil forfeiture or end or do a broader internet search on it, just so you'll understand this is not post conviction. This is pre conviction, sometimes even pre indictment. Okay. Uh, and I'll give you an example about this. I was watching an NPR video, I, I believe on YouTube, it was about a woman, an older lady who owned a little diner in 
the middle in the Midwest somewhere, just like a nondescript diner, nondescript city. And she only took cash because she didn't want to accept and pay for all the credit card fees, you know, on the merchant account, you know, 3% or, or so, you know, it was just a cash only business. And she would make the deposits every day or every couple of days from her restaurant in cash to the bank. And the government accused her of structuring and they arrested her and they seized her bank accounts and they I, I don't remember like they seized her business or she couldn't operate her business because she had no money to pay her suppliers and the townspeople like raised money to help her because this was such a massive injustice so this is a, a, a scary thing but how does that apply to you know a professional poker player well, it's a slightly different example, the structuring example, but civil asset forfeiture as a professional blackjack player. So just a quick distinction, the blackjack player is beating the casinos. The poker player is beating other players. Oh, got right? it. Yeah. So as a poker player, you wire money all over the place. There's no real issues at all because you're always using your real name. Not the case as a blackjack player. As a blackjack player, you're incognito all the time. I can't go into any casino in this and give my real name and try and sit at a table. They would automatically either tell me no or something worse. So uh, the point being is that if you're playing in Louisiana and then traveling down the I-10 to Biloxi, that's a notorious stretch of highway where the cops are essentially pirates. <laughs> that wow. they'll, they'll come up with whatever reason to search your car <laughs> and in searching your car as in that situation you're going to have cash on you and i don't know if you know this about me you probably knew at one time and forgot but i had a partner we were in puerto rico won a decent amount of money between the two of us we're leaving puerto rico with around a hundred thousand dollars in cash this is in 2004 four or five. And, and, and poor, you know, of course we got to note Puerto Rico is officially part of the United States. So go ahead. Yeah. That's important for yeah. sure for this story. So we leave Puerto Rico. TSA is like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. What's with all this money? We are like, we explain ourselves, show some receipts. Leave Puerto Rico. They're eventually like, okay, go ahead. We see the cash, but whatever. We land in Atlanta, which we're, then our, that's our uh, what, layover city. We're going from Atlanta then to Las Vegas. In Atlanta, what, while at our gate, we're surrounded by the DEA. Oh, and my gosh. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, we're aware of this whole uh, asset forfeiture situation, of course. So we have uh, the receipts from the casino. Mm -hmm. We have strategy books. We have our tax returns that say we're professional gamblers. Mm -hmm. We have a letter from our lawyer saying that we travel with cash. Right. Because you're, you're, you're prepared for this as a smart person. That's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because unfortunate, I mean, it's a, an unfortunate situation that we would be so, so prepared for it because we know it's that big of a risk, but we have all this documentation and they're like, cool. And they seize the money. They wow. seize the hundred thousand dollars. And they then, just they just took the money and d how did you get it back or did you get it back? Great question. Um, we uh, we had a lawyer basically start going after them and explaining the whole like talking to them and talking to the the DA that wound up with the case and eventually we did get the money back. It only took a couple months to get it back. Our lawyer said we were probably about five to 10% to get it back within that time frame. He was like, this never, this is like a very rare circumstance to get the money back. But we got fortunate that the, the, uh, I think the word is prosecutor, whoever on the government's team got the case. She yep. was not like a bad person trying to like rack up stats. She was right, just, right. Like, and a lot of right. these government people, you think like what's in it for them? Well, their career is in it for them. This is their resume. This is how you build your resume sure. uh, at the DEA's office and how you get promoted. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. In some of the local asset forfeiture situations, the, the, the precinct that takes the money and keeps the money it becomes part of their budget. So it's they're even more incentivized to, to take it. But anyway, we got lucky. Uh, this, this lady like said, you know, you guys were clearly in the right here. We're going to give it back. But 
What we then did is part of the DEA team that surrounded us. Um, we, uh, one of they used local officers as well. Part of the, I, I guess they were part of the Atlanta police department. Yeah. And, uh, we went after them and sued them in that, that case, uh, went all the way to the U S Supreme court. So I have one of those little, you know, uh, wow. Gibson versus the United States of America. Oh if you want to, if you, you want any, uh, uh, if you ever want to waste 10 years and a lot of money, you can try and come up with your own Supreme court case. That is amazing. Keith, I got to say, <laughs> that, is, that is, that is amazing. So, so you, your case went to the U S Supreme court and what happened? So it's not as like cool as being like, a, a, a case of like, are they going to rule that the U S can take money from their citizens? Right. Technically what was being argued was an argument of jurisdiction in okay. which jurisdiction. Can we um, go after this guy is essentially what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it went to the uh, California. So what they're the ninth, right? The ninth, the ninth, sir. Oh, they're crazy. They we're on yeah. our team. Mm -hmm. They, they, they were like, yeah, you guys are right, shockingly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the U.S. Supreme Court shot it down. So that mm -hmm. was the end of that. I, and I oh. should say, I ha we had a ton of help. A lot of people did a lot of pro bono work on our yeah. behalf uh, the whole way through. So it was like, uh, you know, that we had like ton tons of help the whole way through. But yeah. anyway. I, I bet you're our only client who's had a Supreme Court case. So Gibson, <laughs> Gibson versus the United States of America. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Wow. Well, yeah. yeah. So I, if you if you ser Google search my name in the Supreme yeah. Court, the case would come up. It, it has my partner's name. What on. year was that? I think it started in 2005, but I could yeah. be misremembering. And I think the ruling finally happened in maybe 2014. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, like nine years, you know, that's about how fast justice moves. Yeah. So, <laughs> slow, I, I mean, slow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like I said, tangent or, but that was all yeah. about how does one become, where does one's libertarian thinking start? And it sure see how that level of government involvement in, in, yeah. in our profession just sort of like gets you thinking about things and thinking about things. And so that, that naturally, if you are libertarian enough, <laughs> you you very quickly find out about the Federal Reserve and inflation, right? Mm -hmm, right. And so that, just through that that alone gets you like, okay, well, how do we how do, how do we battle these Fed policies to protect our wealth? And then you come to real estate pretty quickly, mm -hmm. multi-dimensional asset class, Jason. That's I've heard someone say that. <laughs> yeah. So. So yeah, that, that, that kind of, that's, that's a 15 minute tangent into how'd you get into real estate, but yeah, okay. that, that's the answer. Yeah, that's, that's great. So you believe that it's a great inflation fighting tool, I guess. And, and you believe that inflation is, is coming probably right. I'm, I'm putting, yeah, I don't want to do. put too many words in your mouth. Well, I don't really know the answer. I, I do. I do think that inflation is coming and it certainly appears to be the case that the way that the government is currently approaching some of their new programs is to more or less hand out money directly to people. Mm -hmm. At least they have this year. So that can stimulate inflation a lot faster than, say, their 2008-2009 uh, approach of just handing banks money. That doesn't right. necessarily promote inflation. You saw that that's not really what happened. Certainly not broad-based inflation. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you've gone over that many times on your podcast, but you know, I don't, I don't really know, you know, uh, have you had Jeff Booth on price of tomorrow? Yes, I had him on. He's the deflation guy. He and, is. uh, and, and he was on recently. You missed that episode, Keith. I thought you listened to every single episode. I've listened to all 7 million of your podcasts across <laughs> 37, 37 different shows. Yeah. Hey, Hey, listen, you're, you're pretty good at, uh, you know, reminding me of things I said on the podcast. So <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's yeah. right. That's true. Yeah. The, um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm actually pretty much in his camp. I, I think the tech technological deflation, you know, I don't know exactly whether the real rate of inflation goes up or not, but for sure they're making 
the natural rate higher than it would be. The natural, right. the natural state of things is the deflation. And you see because of technology. And I agree with you. So yeah. again, you know, I've explained it before, you know, it's this war on, on one hand, you've got technology. On the other hand, you've got bad fiscal and monetary policy and which will win the war remains to be seen. The problem is that technology actually depends on the laws of evolution, right? You know, like technology evolves, it gets better and better. And that is definitely deflationary. And until you sometimes run into a wall where Metcalf's law, you know, the doubling in speed of a processor, or no, Moore's law, sorry, Metcalf is the network law, doubling in speed every 18 months doesn't really happen forever because you can only double so much, right? It, you know, it doesn't necessarily happen forever. And we'll see, you know, but they can create an unlimited amount of money. And by the way, at the time of this recording, I should say, in the last 10 months, 35% of all US dollars in existence were created in 10 months, not 100 years, 10 months. <laughs> Yeah, uh, under under the quote unquote conservatives, right? Yes, the conservative administration of Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Just just wait if Biden becomes president, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I and, and that sort of just ties into what we're talking about. You know, depending on how they approach the these government programs, if they're giving money directly to people through what's a, essentially a UBI, you know, uh, universal, universal basic, basic income. income. Yeah. yeah, they're gonna they're gonna wind up. Uh, I mean, you could actually see that hyperinflation and regardless of exactly how, like whether you see an inflation or a hyperinflation, what you're for sure getting is a devaluing of the dollar. So how do, you know, if you're holding on to dollars, your net worth is melting away, really. It might right. be going up nominally, yeah. but your purchasing power is for sure going away. It's impossible for it not to if they print dollars. Just And, and thankfully, the value of your debt is going away, as, as I've taught, because that's inflation-induced debt destruction. So having those three decade-long fixed-rate mortgages are, it's beautiful because you get to pay the money back in ever cheaper dollars. So as much as philosophically you and I hate inflation and bad monetary and fiscal policy, we can align our interests with these powerful forces, right? Yeah, and, and that's just the correct bet to make, right? You can disagree with it all you want, but right. not doing something about it when you know that that's the direction the like elites are gonna go would just be silly, you know? Yeah. Just so, the, in, in, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say, you know, the thing we should really, I think, discuss a little bit is the way this inflation is so uneven, because I, I've talked recently a lot about the Cantillion effect, uh, named after the economist Richard Cantillion, and, and that postulates that the people closest to the money get the most when the government spigot is is running, right? And that's definitely happened because the rich are getting so much richer ever since we went off the gold standard in 1971. And it accelerated massively in the 80s and through the 90s and the 2000s. And now, you know, it's just accelerated so much more. Uh, this There is definitely a sort of a winner take all system that we're in. This is one way we can kind of become a proxy and be cantillionaires ourselves. There's a lot of asset inflation, Keith. You know, consumer price inflation is pretty reasonable, but asset inflation is putting people out of the asset market to where they can't access the investor class. And I think that the long-term effect of that is pretty huge for young people, especially. Yeah, no, I, 100% with everything you just said. I mean, you know, you see the stock market just continually go up despite, you know, so many of these companies just as, essentially big zombie companies, you know. On paper, you wouldn't think they'd be worth much at all, but they their value just goes up and up and up. Yep. And it's because the money printing gets to these people pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. And likewise, you see it in other proxies like, uh, you know, what do you call them? Cyclical market uh, real estate? Yeah, like cyclical Manhattan. markets and versus linear and yeah, hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. So in the, in the Manhattans, the Beverly Hills areas, you just see these prices continually rise because, again, that money that's being 
you know, quote unquote, printed right. gets there gets there first. Yeah, and and you heart. used to in Manhattan. It's different now with COVID and the civil unrest. But but yeah, I get the idea definitely. What have the prices done for those like super high end real estates, like the hundred million dollar places? You know, in this massive winner take all world we're in, they seem to be doing quite well. Still, well, it, amazing. And that's what I was going to say because those places they don't they don't need rent. The people that own those places don't need yeah. rent. That's not what right. they're doing. They're yeah. they're using it as a as an inflation hedge. They're trying right. to preserve their value with it to some degree. I mean, obviously there's probably a little bit more that goes into those specific places, but to, sure. for a lot of people, I mean, you see this with um, specifically Vancouver and the money that gets like shuttled out of, oh. out of mainland China. Yeah. And, and then it just becomes this massive bubble, but nobody's living in those places. Right. 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 And that's the amazing thing about it, you know, where foreign investors will make all sorts of illogical bets and they just drive up the prices of, of things. It's, it's absolutely staggering what's happening. Right. It, it's superficially, like seemingly illogical bets, but given their specific situation due to government interference, whether yeah. it's government interference in monetary policy or government interference in the amount of money you can move out of a country, which, by the way, is the econo what I call the economic Berlin Wall. You know, yeah. you can't move the money in, and that's capital controls. And, you know, you, you lived in Macau, so you know what China is like all, all too well. So go ahead. Yeah, for sure. No, exactly. And I've heard of people from mainland China who would have, like, a big successful company in, in China. Well, hopefully the, the CCP is not listening, right? Yeah, now. well, they are, but okay. go ahead. <laughs> All right. well, we should make our Winnie the Pooh jokes. Then yeah, to, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so they would, they would have their successful company in China. Mm -hmm. Go start a second company in a different uh, offshore district, say, say Singapore. And they would then sue their own company and either settle or lose the suit or whatever. But in doing so, they, that settlement, yeah. however they came up with it, would then remove cash from mainland China and go to this new, this new business. And that's, exactly. And Which, that sort of craziness just highlights like how goofy all these policies are. And, it, and not in the case of China, obviously, but it also like... For, for you and me, people, like free market people, it's also annoying when people are like, you know, free market doesn't work. You're like, what free market? What are you guys talking about? Yeah, How we don't have stuff? a free market. Yeah. yeah. How can this stuff exist in a free market? Well, yeah, why right, right. Such a uh, dead weight loss to all, the, all, all these different scams. The, the free market is a huge myth. We haven't seen that in, in quite a while. You know, you said something really valuable there. And, you know, we talk uh, a lot on the show and we talked earlier a few minutes ago about aligning our interests with these incredibly powerful forces, the two most powerful forces in world history, governments and central banks. OK, we've got to align our interests with them. But another way we can do that is to play the entity game. And you just alluded to it. Right. And I'm telling you, folks, and I'm going to I'm going to pitch just for a second here. Go to jasonhartman.com slash protect and check out our asset protection estate planning webinar because you can do so many amazing things with entities. And right there, what Keith just talked about, how people uh, are able to move money out of an oppressive regime and that repressive regime doesn't have to be international. It could just be the state of California or New York. OK, uh, you know, it, there there are just all kinds of amazing privileges that come to you when you do some of these more sophisticated things, aligning your interests with central banks and governments, using entities. It's just incredibly powerful what you what you can do. And this is what the big wigs do. And I'm not making a moral judgment. I'm not saying it's right. It's really not right always. You know, a lot of these big wigs, you know, they're just playing the system and it really bugs the heck out of me. But I'm not going to be able to change it. I don't have the power to change it. So I'm just going to align my interests with theirs and do what they do. I'm going to learn from them. And that's what I suggest everybody do. Thoughts well, on that? Yeah, that's good advice. And I would frame it slightly differently. It's not like they're maneuvering around the, the system. That's the system that they purposely created. Right. They, yeah. They've figured out ways to make it very complicated for them to protect themselves. Mm-hmm. 
and they don't care about the rest of you. Right. And, and that's true of entities. And it's more, I mean, I'd say it's more obvious in just the tax system. Like mm -hmm. people are like, well, these are loopholes. Write-offs aren't loopholes. These are things that they came up with and put into the law themselves yeah, to protect right. their wealth. So they of don't have to give away 40, 50, 60% every year. Yeah. So folks, all of you listening, you need to do the same thing. Learn from these people instead of, you know, just complaining about it, learn from them. And that's the point we discuss a lot on the podcast. Good. Okay. So Keith, we could talk for hours. We already have talked for hours, you know, in general over the course of us knowing each other. And you're always so interesting to talk to, but I want to make sure we get to some more real estate if we could, before we wrap it up, you know, so tell us about your real estate experience. Like, you know, where, where are you buying properties? Where did you buy? And how's it all going? So, I mean, I, I didn't really break down these numbers as professionally as I probably could have, but I did glance at them. I currently have properties in Arkansas, Tennessee, and Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah helped me with all this, as, as did you. I wouldn't yep. have known that I was doing otherwise. I got the number that I was up over the last four years, about 300% with those. Wow. Okay, wait a sec. We need sound effects for that. Okay. He just said... 300%. Cha-ching. <laughs> Cha <-ching. laughs> I can just do that. You don't have to grab the little toy. I'll just go. I know, but it, it's, I just want to use my little machine. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Cha-ching. <laughs> for people, I mean, your regular audience, they know this stuff, but for newcomers, it can build up fast in different ways. If the property is 100K and you only have to put down 20 to 25K, but then that property, due to all these inflationary effects that we're talking about, goes to 130K. Well, that mm -hmm. 30K, that's yours. Right. Not the banks, the bank that was on the hook for the other 80 to 75 to 80K of that mortgage. So you pick up those. I know that's not how you, you preach things, but right. in this. In, in a situation where the money printing is what it is, it's going to play more of a role. Yeah, it is amazing. And that is the power of leverage. And of course, you got the math on leverage there. $100,000 property, you know, you put down, how much did you say? $20,000 on that example? 20 to 25, uh, yeah. 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 And so then it goes up $30,000 and your leveraged return is nothing short of phenomenal, of course. But also that debt is getting debased by inflation and you're getting positive cash flow and you're getting tax benefits. Isn't it a beautiful thing? Well, in, in the, I mean, the returns on the tax benefits alone are where if you got nothing else, they're on par with what the S&P annually, right? right? I mean, like 20 something percent is a, with uh, interest and, and I mean, I guess it depends, but you know, yeah. so you have that. And then I would caution people, um, you know, I think a lot of people get really caught up in the cash flow aspect of things. I know, they, 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 the cash it. flow is the minor detail. It's it the really tip is. of the iceberg. So much of it is is stuff you don't see. So yeah, why would you tell us what you were gonna say? It's just such a small part of things. I, I mean, it was like, relatively speaking to these numbers that I did, I mean, it was barely anything. The cash flow part of it. What I mean, you wind up paying. You know, you might get some cash flow in here, but you wind up wind up paying an expense over here, and you might get close to zero and still wind up with you know a hundred percent return. Isn't that incredible? That's that's just it's such an incredibly durable asset. It's amazing. It really is. Well, so it, Keith, yeah, well, I just want to say one thing. I've been bad about this over the years. I do some things right and some things pretty bad. I, I just would really encourage your your audience to take action. It's real easy to be like, oh, the price right now is higher than it ever has been. Yeah, that's because of what we've been talking about, all this money printing, you know, yep. you have to do something to protect yourself. It doesn't matter that it's higher than it was last year or the year before that, or if you had gotten in in 2013, you'd be up X amount. Just do something. Yeah. Right. Look, folks, in an era of artificially low negative interest rates, if you're not long on income property right now, you're going to miss the boat. You know, we have a very, as much as I don't want to even have a Federal Reserve, and I know you don't either, I think the value of money or dollars or currency should be controlled by a market rather than a than a company. It's literally a company, right? The Federal Reserve. They're very transparent though. I mean, this time around, it's not like the old days. The Fed has made no bones about it. Interest rates are going to be low for the next three years, period. 
That's what they've said. They don't care about inflation. They're not worried about inflation. Okay, fine. You better be long on real estate right now. Uh, now, not all real estate. You know, there are certainly markets, and and you know, learn more about that on prior episodes. But the right kind of real estate, you need to be in a long position on that right now. Yeah, for sure. And anybody that's in your audience that thinks it's kind of out of reach, I mean, there are so many properties that only require you know ten to fifteen. K 20 K down that you yep. can get started with and start to see those returns. And if you can't afford that, you got to be working on yourself. You, yeah. That needs to be what your time is right now. Cause yep. this time in human history, and I, I'm aware that this is something that's been said many times, but this time feels different. <laughs> yeah. There's like a tsunami coming. There's never right. been like this worldwide devaluation of money ha- happening simultaneously. And if you're not doing something to, to make sure you're not going to get washed away in that tsunami, uh, you're messing up. If you're playing yeah. call of duty, you know, without having, you know, enough, enough money to, to, to invest in real estate, then you're making a tragic decision. You got to be doing self-improvement, online education, learning about business, have a side hustle, whatever, so you can get the money to invest. Absolutely. And just want to talk about cryptocurrency for a moment too. I know you're a fan of Bitcoin. You know, the, the global currency situation is a coordinated race to the bottom really ultimately it's every currency is just devaluing now which one will devalue more or less remains to be seen but they're all going down (laughs) okay i think we can agree on that and that means prices go up asset prices go up income property prices go up and this rather new thing bitcoin which is only what 12 years old now something like Uh, that 2009 so yeah. 11 years old. So it's kind of amazing what's happened. And I just wonder if it's a big farce. There are arguments for and against it, of course, just like there are for gold. But at the very least, it's a measuring stick, isn't it? It shows you what people are thinking. Well, yeah, you know, there, there's always the question of, is something going up? Or, you know, when you have dollars, you know, dollars per Bitcoin right now, it, you know, today, I think it's at $23,000 per Bitcoin. You're always left with, well, is, is this getting more valuable or is this getting less valuable? You know, it, it, when, there, when there's t- two sides to, the, to every trade, right? So in other yeah. words, compare it to the dollar and it shows you that there is a lot of belief in inflation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you just, you see that continually going up and going back to what you said about how all the monies are are being printed and uh, they're all going down. You know, it's very easy for people to, you know, get stuck in their, their own timeline where it's like, oh, the US dollar has been around my entire life. Therefore, it will continually continue to be around, you know, but it's pretty rare for a fiat currency to succeed for any long period of time. The only two really in existence uh, are the the pound and the US dollar that have been around for like the last, uh, what, over, over 75 years. And as you already alluded to in this call, the US dollar has defaulted more than once. 1971 being the last and biggest time. It's a currency that has defaulted. I would, I would argue that this US dollar is not the same as the US dollar from 100 years ago. Of course, it's not the same. And, uh, you know, we were in Jekyll Island uh, learning all about that. So yeah, no, it's it's definitely a different dollar. Yeah, exactly. And so the reason these currencies wind up dying, you know, they, they, they burn out like big, those big stars, they just eventually get too much, too much going on, and then just explode. The money printing, And what that signals is that these monies are not hard monies. You know, hard money is an inflation-proof money. And gold played that role for millennia. And really, it only became co-opted by governments because it's so hard to verify that gold is what it is. And it's hard to transact. You know, you can't really, if I want to purchase property in, in France or something, you know how hard it is to send gold? It's a very difficult thing. So two of the most important aspects of a money are it's what's called saleability across time and across space. Saleability is essentially, I I guess, transactability would be the best. Mm -hmm. So across time, gold's pretty obvious. 
that it's a strong winner. It wins mm-hmm. because of its durability. It wins because of its stock to flow ratio. It's hard to bring on more production of gold just because people want more gold. Whereas right. with dollars, they can literally do it with the snap of a finger. Um, and the reason that that same same phenomena is why you see uh, copper was never really a money throughout time because it's so easy to make more of it. You're doing the equivalent of printing it because it's just easy to bring more online as the price goes up. The sure. price of gold goes up. It's very difficult to bring more online. The price of Bitcoin goes up. It's You can't bring more online. It's in the code. You can only bring in what is written into the code. There's not but, be more than 21 million. But you can bring in another cryptocurrency. And that's where, you know, the argument of it's all, it's so fiat. It's more fiat than the dollar, right? Um, in a sense like that. But I, I, I don't know. What do, you, what do you say to that? I, I would just go back to the same analogy I just used. I'm talking about gold. And then somebody else is saying, well, yeah, but you can, what about, why don't we just use this copper over here? And the answer is because you're right. That copper is inflatable because it's so easy to bring more of that thing online. Mm-hmm. That is not the same as bringing more gold online. So it's just because somebody can come up with Ethereum doesn't mean that that's the same. That doesn't change Bitcoin's monetary properties. Fair enough. It's just that everybody has to keep believing Bitcoin is the thing. And of course, I do agree with you that it is in a class by itself. You know, feel free to speak on that. Yeah, I would just say that I've heard this before, that somehow money is like this shared delusion. And it's, I don't agree with that really, because it's a tool and tools have properties. And the best properties for a tool went out. And so these, these things that are, you know, important, we've already mentioned is like the saleability across time and space. If everybody wants to have the shared delusion that a rotary phone is the best phone, but you and I use cell phones and you and I are the only two because everybody else believes we're just, uh, we're morons you and I will wind up taking over the world with our improved efficiencies. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like we'll be so powerful with how much time we save. We'll start taking over entire cities and then, and then countries and stuff like that, because that's how powerful the difference is. So the fact that it's a tool that has these properties matters. It's not the case that money is a shared delusion. I get what people are saying. And I haven't really hammered out my thoughts entirely on this, but it doesn't feel right to say that it's just a shared delusion. That's for sure isn't correct. To what yeah. degree it's not correct, I, I, I don't know, but. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, Keith, we got to wrap it up and maybe since, you know, we're mostly about real estate, but that's, you know, that's interesting. And I, I completely uh, agree with your thinking on that. And I do agree that as far as the crypto world goes, uh, Bitcoin really is a different animal than the others. So uh, uh, very much true. And and we'll just see if it, it can displace gold. You know, that'll be interesting. You know, we got 6,000 years of history or so with gold. It'll just be interesting to see what happens and how this all plays out no question about it yeah it's obviously a big topic and in, in you know we're not gonna hammer it out in a in a 30 minute <laughs> no way. Yeah. Oh, for sure yeah. but what i would encourage people to do is i would encourage them to answer the question how did gold become money and then the second question how did gold fail as money if you can answer those questions you'll wind up with the answer bitcoin yeah, very interesting. And um, any more comments on real estate? Since we are uh, real estate focused, I just thought I'd wrap it up with that. And, you know, we'll have you back on another time. <laughs> five years, five yeah. years from now again. Yeah, the, uh, the it's hard to get Keith on a show. Believe me, folks. <laughs> uh, anything else about real estate? Yeah, I would just say, you know, it has to be part of your portfolio. And It needs to be part of your capital. Don't feel like it's out of reach for you. Just work on yourself so it's in reach for you. And don't worry about what the price was. Get that out of your head. Right. Whether it's a good bet or not is a question about today, not where the price was. Just one more note on that for Mr. 300% return on investment with with his income properties, which is awesome, is that the price is not always the price. You know, 
people are buying properties based on a payment. And as we've talked about, if inflation adjusted, the payment has actually gone down with these in, insanely low, ridiculously low interest rates. So while the, the sticker price may be higher, the monthly cost on which most people buy, including investors, so, you know, the vast majority of people buy on a monthly payment, not a price, has actually gotten lower in real terms based on inflation and interest rate and the price of the house. So it's pretty phenomenal time. And I think this market's got some definite steam in it for a while. I'm, I'm still quite bullish. Good stuff. Well, Keith, thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate it. And, but we didn't even talk about your other company, your e-commerce business. So uh, next time. Yeah, no problem. Some other time. <laughs> Absolutely. Good stuff. Thanks for joining us. See you, buddy.